On Thursday night, I attended a 30-year high school reunion for the Brighton Grammar School class of 1990. Like so much of life in 2020, it was on Zoom. Two dozen old boys and a couple of our teachers were able to join, so about a quarter of the year level, including a handful from overseas. The previous record for other Zoom school reunions this year for the 40-year reunion was three and a half hours. Our gathering started at 7 p.m. and the keen ones were still going after 1.30 a.m. So the lads were pleased to smash that record. There was lots of reminiscing and rehashing of schoolboy banter, as you can imagine, as well as some sharing of the joys and hard knocks during the 30 year journey since we graduated. A couple of things really struck me. After 30 years, at least for those on the call, the sense of connection and the desire to stay connected are still really strong. A few of the guys were at school together from kindergarten and all of us walked a formative stretch of life together. That shared experience bonds us. We talked a lot about the significance of staying connected for friendship and mutual support. The other thing that hit me is a bit more sobering. The current principle reflected that the biggest change in the school culture since our time is the emphasis on the boys' overall well-being, physical, mental and emotional. I would want to add spiritual well-being to that list but I digress. On hearing that, my mind went straight to the old boys who couldn't join the call. Not the ones who weren't there, but the ones who couldn't be. You see, from a class of a hundred or so, a number of my old classmates have committed suicide, several of them in the years immediately after high school. Popular, talented young men with a life of opportunities open before them. Indeed, when we were at school at Brighton Grammar, the wealthy suburb of Brighton had the highest suicide rate in Victoria. What was it that the Beatles sang about money and love? I couldn't help wondering, what if someone had reached out to those young men in that time of distress? What if someone had walked alongside them, stood with them, sat beside them through that dark night of the soul, opened a pathway to help for them in their time of need? I've been thinking a lot about that conversation while preparing this week's sermon, and I want to share two thoughts with you. The first is very simple and practical. Stay connected with people. As the threat of the virus lingers, as lockdown continues and as the economic impact of the pandemic begins to bite more, a lot of people will struggle with accumulated stresses piled on top of life's usual travails. There is joy to be had even during this time, but for lots of people it may be drowned in an overwhelming tide of sadness, fear and anger. One of the most basic things you can do to care for yourself and others is to stay connected. Reach out to a family member, a housemate, a friend, a colleague, a neighbour, a church member. Ask them how they are. Make a little time to listen and offer to pray for them. It's one of the most powerful things we can do at the moment as an expression of care for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and love of neighbour. And it's okay to be not okay. When someone asks how you are, it's okay to tell them you're having a hard time. It's okay to reach out to someone and say, I'm having a tough time and I wondered if we could talk. I particularly want to say that to the men today. It's Father's Day, and at this time of year, the media plays on male stereotypes, 
like the superhero dad, the rugged solo adventurer, and the man whose only passions in life are sport and power tools. It's all right, there's nothing wrong with sport and power tools. Our wider society has picked up on the importance of meaningful social connections for men's mental health. How much more should we do that in the church? A community that seeks to reflect the love, acceptance and forgiveness of God in our relationships with one another. Stay connected with people. That's the first thing I want to say today. Second, draw near to God confidently through Jesus. That's where we can find grace to help us in our time of need. We have been reflecting in recent weeks on the incarnation of Christ. We have examined the Bible's affirmation that Jesus Christ is the God-man, one person who is truly God and truly human. And we've been asking what that means for us. We have seen that the Son of Man became human in order to reveal God the Father to us, to make God known. We have seen that the Son of God became human in order to be our rescuer. Today, we see that the Son of God has shared our humanity so that he can empathise with our weaknesses and represent us before God as a merciful high priest. If you thought high priests only belonged to Old Testament times, not so. You need a great high priest today. And the name of the high priest you need is Jesus. The role of priests in the Old Testament, and especially the high priest, was a mediatorial one to be go-betweens, representing God to the people and the people to God. The New Testament ascribes that role to Jesus. We read in Hebrews 7, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Earlier in the letter to the Hebrews, we learn that Jesus is the best person to represent us, the perfect one to intercede for us, the ideal go-between because of the Incarnation. Listen to these verses. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful High Priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In Hebrews 2, we see an idea that we came across last week. God's Son became human so that he could make atonement for the sins of the people. That is, so that he could rescue us by dying for our sins as our sacrificial substitute. In that sense, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 says, he is the one mediator between God and human beings. In both those short readings we just heard from Hebrews 2 and 4, we also see something new. The Son of God became like us, fully human in every way, so that he could help us as one who has personally experienced our struggles. Though Jesus did not sin, he was tempted in every way, 
so that he is able to help those who are being tempted. And he is able to feel sympathy for our weaknesses because he has felt them through the incarnation. The Son of God knows what it is to be born into the helpless dependence of a human baby and into obscurity from the earliest days of his earthly life. He knows what it is to be a political refugee fleeing with his family to a foreign country because his life was in danger. He knows what it is to be hungry and thirsty and tired. He knows what it is to feel tempted by self-interest and the lure of an easy way out. He knows what it is to have no home. He knows what it is to weep for the death of a loved one and the brokenness of the world. He knows what it is to be rejected by people, misunderstood by his own family and betrayed by his closest friends. He knows what it is to feel anguish to the point of sweating blood. He knows what it is to be unjustly accused and condemned. He knows what it is to be cruelly tortured and shamefully executed. And because he died for our sins, he knows a suffering that those who trust in him will never know. He knows what it is to be abandoned by his heavenly Father and suffer the wrath of God. And he knows the hope of all who follow him to be raised from death with a resurrection body because of the incarnation. He knows all this in his own lived experience. And because he knows, he can represent us before God as a faithful and merciful high priest. Marvellously, the implication is not simply that we can depend on Jesus to speak to God the Father on our behalf, but rather that we ourselves can approach God confidently in prayer through Jesus. In John 16, verse 26, Jesus says, In that day you will ask in my name, I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. You will ask. The encouragement in Hebrews is the same. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need.